I will proceed to the legal analysis. So the main question is how friendly is the legal framework that we currently have in the WTO, and I mainly refer to the agreement, the special agreement on subsidy, the SCM agreement, towards this kind of, let's put it, smart subsidies, if there is anything like that. Or to put it another way, how uh, much policy space do these rules grant to members that want to use these subsidies for their uh, industrial uh, policy, their smart industrial policy. If the conclusion is from very, this very, very preliminary review, a uh, very quick review, because the 10 minutes are not a lot, uh, is that the law is not satisfactory, then I will just give you uh, a couple of ideas, and I would like them to, to, to see during the discussion what are your feelings about these ideas on possibilities of law reform. So as I said, this is my assumption. I assume that certain firms, forms of public support may be desirable. And assuming that, what does the rule say? Um, there is just one element here I would like to focus. Uh, I have to say that I'm a bit embarrassed by this, this slide after uh, the great presentation of, of Richard, so I want to, 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 to change it very, very quickly. But there's a, a specific element here which was already underlined by Richard, which is particularly important for the legal analysis. It looks like the design of the subsidy might be very important from the policy perspective. Uh, my take is, I'm a lawyer by training, so this is just my take on industrial policy, is that uh, in order to be as much effective as possible, a subsidy in this sector should be also be very much targeted, should be specific, should distinguish, should differentiate. We have seen uh, how smart industrial policy should be done, and we have seen how it is important that it targets certain activities, certain types of activities. So keep this in, in mind, because in a few moments we'll see whether the legal framework is responsive to this policy prescription for targeted intervention. Every lawyer that has to address this question, uh, what does the legal framework say about renewable energy subsidy, has to mainly address three questions. Do we have a subsidy? So a definition issue. Is this subsidy objectionable? And even if it is objectionable, can it be justified in some way? If we consider the definition of subsidy, uh, and again here I apologize if I will be very quick on, uh, uh, on the elements, but uh, I assume that most of you know uh, 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 the main elements of the law, and if there are any doubts, please, you know, we can go back to that afterwards in the discussion. The definition of subsidy on, under Article 1 of the SCM agreement provides that you need two concurrent elements. You need to have a form of governmental action. This could be uh, one of the sp specific forms of uh, financial contribution that you have there. And you also need to have, or alternatively, any form, any form of income or price support. And cumulatively, also, you need that this form of uh, governmental action grants a benefit. Now, already at this preliminary level, we have a lot of problems concerning some of the most common uh, forms of subsidies in the renewable energy sector. Um, in particular, I'm referring, for example, to tax incentives, taxation, and regulatory measures. Uh, the legal status of both tax incentives and regulatory measures is very much problematic. It is still very much unclear. So, for example, if we are talking about tax incentives that are pretty much common, just thinking about the case of the United States, uh, it is very difficult to uh, reach a definite conclusion, an ex ante conclusion for a government that proposes to grant a subsidy, whether a certain tax incentive um, um, involves the foregoing of revenue which is otherwise due, according to the language of the agreement. So these two little words, probably many of you are familiar with this, can really cause a headache. You just have to look at the U.S. Foreign Service Corporation saga. You had four reports, uh, uh, two panels reports, two upper body reports. My take in my one previous uh, piece of research was that there were no less than four different criteria used by this settlement in order to interpret these. So this is inherently difficult. It is very much 
uh, a complex to give a definite answer. If we move to regulatory action, what do I re refer to re when I talk about regulatory action in the field of renewable energy? I refer, to, for example, to minimum pricing laws like fitting tariffs, very much common. For the more than 50 countries in the world have this kind of support system. Uh, I also refer to minimum quantitative requirements like blending requirements, renewable portfolio standards, these kind of measures, pretty common. Again, we do not know whether they could amount to a form of financial contribution in definite ways, and we do not know whether they could amount to a form of income or price support. It's an open question, huge question mark. <coughs> if we shift to the benefits, we similarly have a situation of uncertainty. Why is that? Benchmarking is crucial in the benefit analysis, and uh, the relevant yardstick we have told is the marketplace. What is the problem here? The problem is that in the energy sector, the market is heavily regulated, is subject to uh, a lot of forms of public intervention and even private intervention, with the result that it, the signals that the market is sending, in particular prices, might not be fully reliable when it comes to use them as possible benchmarks. Uh, just keep the, the last uh, item there in, in the bullet point that I have there. But already this very brief analysis on the main elements uh, of the definition of subsidy, which is the very first step of the legal analysis. You're talking about what is a subsidy. They provide you this a scenario of diffuse legal uncertainty. And legal uncertainty, of course, does not go hand in hand with policy space, provides a constraint, in my view, to per se to policy space. If we move to the second question, assuming that we know what a subsidy is from a legal perspective, is this subsidy objectionable? Well, you have here the two uh, subsequent steps of the legal analysis, the specificity test and the adverse effects or injury test. Uh, and here we have a different kind of scenario. We still have, of course, a little bit of uncertainty, so the whole area of subsidies is, is, is characterized by a lot of legal uncertainty. But here, uh, my impression is that we have a different kind of problem when we are trying to uh, assess the legal status of renewable energy subsidies. And what is this problem? Uh, if you recall, at the very beginning, I highlighted a specific finding concerning smart subsidies. They should be targeted. They should distinguish. They should differentiate. Possibly, in some cases, they might even discriminate. Now, what is the problem? If this is a policy prescription, if these are the policy prescription, and you just compare them with the guidelines that come out from the law, well, you can see that there is almost a direct clash, a direct conflict, because specificity uh, usually requires uh, that the subsidy is granted on the basis of objective requirement, neutral requirements, <coughs> non-discriminatory requirements, in the case of adverse effects, of course, we always have to carry out a case-by-case -case analysis, but if we want to generalize and make some general prediction, the more the subsidy is neutral, the more the subsidy uh, it does not discriminate or differentiate, probably the less likely it is to be found to cause adverse effects. So again, if you put these two together, my impression is that we might have a dilemma for uh, in mo in most of the cases for the granting government. In order to comply with the trade law prescriptions, you might need to lose the distinct policy preference uh, uh, um, for differentiation, which uh, the best practice seems to uh, be indicating. A further element concerning discriminatory subsidies, which are very much a broad category. We have just seen that possibly uh, local content uh, subsidies, which, which are the most topical form of uh, uh, subsidy now, uh, are not the best, one of the best examples of smart industrial policies. But let's assume for, for a moment that in some cases, uh, non-discriminatory subsidies, like even local content, possibly the most extreme form, might be a good form of industrial policy. Now, we have an inconsistency here, and I'm just focusing on the second bullet point and the, sub, the first sub bullet point, forgive me for the uh, little bit of confusion, but uh, it looks like that at the economic level, at the economic uh, uh, plane, when we look at the effects, uh, local content subsidies can be very much equaled 
to production or domestic subsidies. I'm just referring to the finding of Alan Sachs in a couple of very important papers. If this equivalence, if this is in principle correct, this equivalence of effects between local content subsidies and production subsidies is correct, well, we would expect naturally every reasonable person that even the legal treatment of these two different types of subsidies would be similar. But here, as most of you know, uh, we find a very important inconsistency. Production subsidies, domestic subsidies, are substantially permitted, unless, of course, they cause adverse effects, in which case they may be actionable. Uh, by contrast, local content subsidies are straightly prohibited. I'm not saying strictly, because at least in principle there is always the possibility of a justification. I pause here for a second. I will go back to this point. But you see that there is a variance which might be dramatic in terms of policy space granted to member. So my, my, my point here, uh, I'm just a lawyer, I'm raising the issue. Is this correct? Is it correct that you have an equivalence in economic effects between production subsidies and local content subsidies? If so, how on earth is the legal regulation distinguishing between them? Is it just a matter of form? Or should we challenge the premise that possibly these two types of subsidies are not fully equal from an economic perspective? And if so, again, going back to the legal regulation, is the actual differentiation variation that we have, substantial permission on the one hand and straight prohibition on the other hand, the most appropriate uh, regulatory response? Or possibly we should consider downgrading, uh, in a way, the prohibition of local content subsidies and maybe have a rebuttable presumption of serious prejudice like used to be in Article 6.1 of the SCM agreement. Just, you know, brainstorming here. I don't have an answer. Just want to raise doubts. Just want to raise the issue. Um, if you stop for a second and consider what I've been saying up to now, it looks clear that the current discipline of subsidies is not very much friendly towards countries that might decide to adopt subsidies for uh, the support of the renewable energy sector. This is for various reasons. At, at the very least, a, a scenario of legal uncertainty, and in some cases, even inconsistencies, or even direct clashes between policy prescription and legal requirements. I have just answered two questions. Do we have a subsidy? Do we have an objectionable subsidy? We still have one question to answer, if you recall from the beginning. Is the subsidy justifiable? I didn't think that there was any slide here uh, to be used because the answer is very simple. The answer is no. The SCM agreement, as it now stands, does not have any specific discipline providing any sort of, call it exception, justification, legal carve out for any type of subsidy which might provide also a positive effect, including, of course, in general environmental subsidies and some climate change or renewable energy subsidies. We used to have a limited category of non-actionable subsidies uh, in the original architecture of the SCM agreement, but as you, most, of, uh, most of you know, this category, you could also look at it from the uh, lens of a glass house effect. Uh, we have, to be true, a uh, few cases recently focusing on local content subsidies, possibly because these are the easier targets. There are various ways of interpretation, of interpreting these uh, litigation, some say that they are mistakes, they were mistakes by the members that started this litigation. Others say that there is a strategic element there because there are, uh, this, this, the litigation, these cases were started just to reinstate or reestablish the rules of engagement, the rules of the game to reestablish this tacit agreement. Well, other people say, are saying that this might be the beginning of a trend of increasing litigation and controversy in the field of renewable energy. So we might have even more cases which will not possibly focus only on local content requirements. Um, so the big question is the one in the last bullet point. Shall we expect more litigation? And will this litigation expose that the equilibrium that we have had so far underlying this tacit agreement is possibly not a stable equilibrium. If this is the case, we have a very strong practical point in order to say we have to do something with the discipline. But even leaving aside this practical point, I think that the scenario that I have depicted so far 
is enough, a good reason, to say we have to do something with the discipline. But before saying something on this, I just want to <coughs> focus on this, but very briefly, because I know this is uh, a sort of uh, uh, taboo in the trade war. Uh, if we really think hard, uh, going beyond the SCM agreement and looking at the broader WTO legal system, that might be a provision which could help in giving some legal shelter and providing some uh, protection for, for some of these subsidies. This is Article 20 of the GATT. I'm not spending a lot of this, a lot of time on this. We might go back to, back, uh, to this. I don't think it, it, it is a technical issue in the sense that uh, uh, it is technically possible, in my view, to apply Article 20 to the GATT of the Dutch subsidies. Um, there are no fundamental obstacles as I see them. At the very least, the arguments in favor and against cancel each other out. That's my impression. Second consideration, for sure, a finding of application of Article 20 of the GATT will be politically troublesome. Everybody, I think, here knows that. Third consideration, having said that, I think it's a credible possibility considering all the circumstances, some of the positive signals coming from the case law, and I'm referring particularly to applied body report in China periodicals, the stall in the negotiations, the trade negotiations, in the climate negotiations, the increasing, possible increasing trend of litigation, and the simple fact that the defense might be a reason uh, raised in the right case. Um, I'm not touching the other point, uh, whether if we pass master the first obstacles, whether you could actually apply it to subsidies for renewable energy, maybe even to discriminatory subsidies. We might come back to that uh, afterwards. Just one word on the possible new discipline, because in my view, this is inevitable. We have uh, the first best scenario uh, is certainly not to apply Article 20. It's too flexible, too troublesome. The first best scenario is for the members to uh, go back to the negotiating table and to devise something, maybe following the inspiration of the previous category of non-actionability, uh, maybe expanding that, but uh, negotiating would allow members to discuss and to tailor the legal shelter as they see fit to uh, the uh, current problems and current uh, uh, um, instances of smart industrial policy. Few guidelines that might be followed. There are two in particular that are important in my view. The first is transparency. Transparency is the first precondition. There was an excellent piece which was published in the World Trade Review last year by Collins Williams and Wolf on transparency in the WTO and using the, as a case study the subsidies agreement. There is a lot there to draw on. The transparency is the, pre, uh, uh, the first precondition of any future digital on subsidies. Secondly, Linked to that, the idea of uh, combining to the traditional hard law track, whereby you have these provisions telling you what are the conditions and terms and intensities and uh, eligibility uh, terms which need to be satisfied in order to have a good subsidy, a legitimate subsidy or not, to uh, combine to, to this a soft governance track. Uh, I'm just thinking here about something uh, like what happens in the SPS committee. Um, and with this, I uh, conclude, as you can see, uh, we might have some policy space under the current rules, but I don't think this is enough. There, are, there is too much uncertainty uh, over there, and in some cases, even inconsistency with policy prescription between legal requirements and policy prescription. We might leave it to the dispute settlement, but you can appreciate that this would put uh, a too much burden on this settlement and these, any possible result coming up from them would very much be a piecemeal approach subject to the vagaries of litigation. Reform of justifications, in my view, is necessary and is possibly the best way out. In this regard, just a final point. Some inspiration, some inspiration could be drawn by the EU, the EU stated law system, where we have a very complex and sophisticated uh, uh, system of uh, justifications. Thank you very much for your attention.